Hey, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Stephen Sheriff. I am the Events and Development Coordinator for Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, which basically means I organise Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival. Um, I'm going to just run through a quick agenda for this morning. Um, probably this session will probably take no more than half an hour um, and we'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, I am also recording the session, so if you'd rather not appear in the recording, just keep your camera off um, and the recording will be shared. Um, probably I'll put it on our website and I'll also be shared by email with, with everyone so you can catch up or share it with anyone you know who wasn't able to make it. Um, so I'm going to start off with a little bit of an intro about Glasgow Building Preservation Trust and um, talk about Doors Open Days and, and where it all came from. Um, we'll then talk about uh, what it means to participate in the festival. Um, we'll move on to discussing the festival theme for the year. Um, and then I'm very glad that we are joined by Judith Dix from Carbon Consultancy. And Judith is going to talk to us a bit about um, the climate emergency and what we are going to be doing to address it. Um, we'll then have an opportunity to ask any questions that anyone has of Judith. Um, and then we will talk about some, well, the, basically the festival format for this year, which is a little bit different to last year, but, but not very. Um, we'll then just go through the submissions um, process and I'll point out some resources and as I said we'll have an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, if anyone does have any questions that occur to them throughout the session please feel free to pop them in the chat and I'll have a wee review of that at the end. Um, okay so Glasgow Building Preservation Trust, GBPT is essentially a charitable property developer um, and we repair, rescue and restore buildings across the city and return them to their communities. Um, GBPT was established in 1982. So last year we celebrated our 40th anniversary and this is, this is our 40th anniversary year and um, we will have some events to celebrate that in the programme this year. The Brigitte Fish Market was our first project um, and at that point we were called the Bridgegate Trust, um, becoming GBPT a few years later. Um, but another few examples of GBPT projects here. So this you might recognize is Castle Milk Stables, um, not looking too great before we got our hands on it. Um, and this is it now. Now it's organized, it's uh, run by the Castleton Trust and they have a really fantastic community program there. Um, and this is GBPT's most recent project, the West Boathouse on Glasgow Green. Um, and this photograph, I think, is uh, maybe like 2014-ish. Um, maybe went around when we started working or chatting about the project. Um, and then this one, I think, is by looking by the trees, I think it's autumn last year. Um, and this is kind of the works are well underway. Uh, and, the, and they're putting the roof on. And then now you can see what the boathouse looks like here. Um, this is a photograph taken at night uh, by uh, one of the club members. Um, but GVPT doesn't just deliver um, capital building projects for the restoration of heritage buildings. We also run community engagement activities. And in 2021 and 2022, we ran a project funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund called My Historic Neighbourhood. Um, and here you can see uh, a couple of young women who uh, made a film to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Badders Market. The project celebrated the heritage um, on the doorstep of communities around Glasgow. Um, one aspect of it was in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the market. And here you can see uh, a group of former traders uh, the lady in the centre, uh, I think she was, she was about 90 years old, and uh, she came and shared some stories of the market. Um, and one thing we were also doing was collecting some of the phrases that people used to shout as traders uh, to encourage folks to come to their stall. Um, things like horrible, terrible, awful, tragedy, that was something that uh, 
uh, one of the traders used to shout um, who was selling newspapers. So we collected all of these uh, phrases and we actually engraved them into the pavements. And here you can see uh, Gavin Mitchell, Peter Mortimer and Alison Thulis MP uh, uncovering Huddy Huddy Mrs Murray, which you can see on the street um, on Kent Street and Mancar Street, just on the corner there. Um, on the opposite corner, you can see Get Your Lucky Knickers. Um, and that was a phrase that was shouted by Josie Lucky Knickers, who sold, not surprisingly, knickers. Uh, someone else joining us. Um, another aspect of the project was celebrating the heritage of roller skating in Glasgow. We uncovered, uh, I think it was around 50 rinks in the city since uh, about 1870. Um, and the event culminated, or the, the project culminated in a roller skating event in the Battleland Ballroom and a film screening. Um, so that was really fantastic. The, 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 the Battleland Ballroom um, activity sold out in, I think it was about five minutes. Uh, so really, really popular, which is really encouraging to see that there really is so much enthusiasm for, for these different heritage activities. So back to Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival, um, and just to let you know where it all came from, um, in 1990, John Gerrard, who was the then director of the Scottish Civic Trust, um, was touring in Europe, and he enjoyed Doors Open Days activities there, and he thought that he would bring it to Scotland. So in 1990, Glasgow, Doors of, uh, Glasgow Building Preservation Trust um, ran the first Doors Open Days in Glasgow, um, and AIR also ran uh, a programme that year as well. Um, the programme started off with just a series of, of open buildings, and um, as we know, has grown now to include walks and tours, and, and we'll talk about the, the expansive nature of the programme a little bit later on. Um, so, I mean, the purpose of the festival really is celebrating the city's architecture, culture and heritage. Um, and yeah, as I said, we've got a free programme, very important that it's a free programme open to everyone um, of open buildings and events. And really, we are looking to increase civic pride among Glaswegians and to broaden awareness of the city's rich built and cultural heritage. Um, important to note that Doors Open Days is a national programme um, run um, by the Scottish Civic Trust. I'm glad to see that Emily Sheriff is with us today. Emily is the national coordinator. Um, and so, yeah, it happens in every region in Scotland. Um, and, you know, one thing we are trying to encourage is, is for people to visit not only Glasgow's programme, but to go a bit further afield and visit the programmes around you. So um, I'm going to talk about now the various ways that you can participate in the festival. Um, obviously, the most obvious one is by opening a building. Um, people are really, really curious to see inside spaces that they haven't been into before. Um, and for buildings who are open to the public, we do, uh, or usually we do stress that we ask you to um, be providing something extra um, to make it a special event. Um, if, if for open buildings, you can participate in three in three categories, which you will see on the participant dashboard, which I'll go over a little bit later on. Um, but you can participate with no booking necessary which is our preferred option. I really do encourage as many participants as possible just to throw open the doors and not require bookings. And this is really um, to, to make the festival as accessible as possible. And people can, you know, in an ideal world, people would just find out the buildings that were open and be able to make their way around, um, you know, the city on that weekend and be able to visit as many places as possible. But obviously we recognize that some events are extremely popular, extremely popular and they wouldn't work um, if, kind of, if it was just open as a free-for-all. You'd have huge queues and disgruntled visitors. So, um, you know, some events, you know, they had to be uh, booking essential. And in the past, uh, that has been open to 
either uh, for those bookings to be operated by GBPT, I would set them up for you through Eventbrite, um, or visitors or um, participants have been invited to set those bookings up themselves. Um, this year, we are hoping to integrate the booking process into our website, so getting rid of Eventbrite, um, but those developments on the website are still in process, and I will update you on that as um, as the kind of weeks and months continue, we get closer to the festival. Um, and, and the last way that you can participate with a building is with um, bookings optional. And this would be, for instance, um, that folks can come into the building and have a walk around by themselves. However, if they wanted to um, go on a tour, then they would have to um, they would have to book that. Um, you can also participate by leading a walking trail. Um, these are in-person trails, um, or you can also participate with uh, leading a trail digitally. Um, and I will go through that a little bit later on um, and how you can use an app called Guidego um, to actually deliver your trail. Uh, you can also host an event. So this year we will be back at the Advanced Research Centre um, at the University of Glasgow uh, using their state-of-the-art facilities for our festival hub. Uh, and we'll have a retox programme there. Um, and so you can have a talk as, as your event, um, or you might also want to investigate the possibility of putting on a performance. Um, so we're really interested in the kind of creative responses to heritage, and I'm really interested to talk to you about any ideas you might have for kind of special events. Um, also, we have the other digital ways that you can participate in the program. I've spoken a little bit about um, digital trails, but remember that you can also run your talk digitally. We have like a very successful webinar program, particularly in 2020 and 2021. Um, the, the digital program is also recorded and then archived to our festival website and to our YouTube channel. And we've had over 100,000 hits on the YouTube channel now. So it's really worth remembering. Um, it's worth remembering that uh, these resources will be, um, you'll be able to disseminate them to our audience. Um, okay. Okay, hey, so I'm just gonna we're just gonna remind ourselves a little bit about the uh, Glasgow Doors Open Days Festival 2022 now. So in 2022, we had a whopping 221 listings, um, and those were made up of just less than 100 buildings, um, on about 50 events and trails, um, and then we had a large uh, 
program of digital activities as well, particularly digital trails. We build up that bank each year, making more and more resources available to people. Um, there were over 20,000 visits to the program uh, the last year and over 3,000 digital visits. So yeah, again, just worth remembering um, the impact that those digital resources can have. And also to say, that we uh, have a relationship with the education department at Glasgow City Council, and we will we are developing a program to facilitate more school groups along to activities. But all of the digital resources that you create, they are also disseminated to schools and made available to, um, to teachers to be incorporating into their lessons. And the conversations that we're having with the council and with teachers, they're telling us that, that people are really crying out for resources about uh, their local areas and so that they can engage young people um, on, on you know, the history uh, of their own neighbourhoods. So they are, I do really encourage you to continue to develop these digital resources. Um, everyone agreed that their event was success, which was uh, very, uh, was, was great to hear. Um, and at the bottom here, I've just noted that 18% of our visitors were from areas of the city and the bottom 20% of the Scottish index of multiple deprivation. Um, and I mentioned this because um, widening access to the festival is really important to us and is one of our key areas for development. Particularly, um, I'm interested in hearing from participants who would like to run events in the north and the east of the city. To, uh, historically, the program has been a bit thinner in those areas. Perhaps that's because, you know, some of those heritage buildings have been pulled down um, through, uh, during um, periods of development, redevelopment um, in the city, but there is a wealth of heritage in, in those areas of the city. So I am really interested to support anyone who would like to run activities there. Um, I'll have a, a quick look at uh, the programme last year. So this was from tours of the Sheriff Port, always really popular. Um, I think at some point, maybe the kids get locked up in the jail, but perhaps not long enough uh, for, to keep the parents happy. Um, here we've got uh, the talks and tours at Glasgow Sculpture Studios. Uh, sorry, this one's at Glasgow School of Art Archives. Um, but also in the Whiskey Bond, you also have the Alistair Gray Archive and Glasgow Sculpture Studios. And three organisations have got together and actually run tours out with the Doors Open Days programme, which has been a really exciting development. And it really go, does go to show that sometimes, you know, getting involved in Doors Open Days, it can open up new avenues for activities for organisations. Uh, and this photograph is from tours of Maryville, Maryhill Bar Halls, um, and they had a whole variety of activities on. A little note about the selection criteria. Um, I'm going to talk about the theme in a moment. Um, we are always looking for events which are as accessible as possible. Um, events which encourage children and young people to come to the festival. Part of our, our relationship and our partnership with the education department is about um, facilitating more school groups to the festival. Um, but we are really looking to, to continue to diversify our audience. And so anyone who would like to uh, create an event which really is focused on children and young people, again, I'm really happy to, um, to offer you my time to support uh, the development of your activity. Um, and as always, um, events which uh, are offer an educational aspect to them. Um, a note on relevance, we are a heritage and culture festival, um, so, you know, as we do have a, a relatively wide scope, um, but we do ask participants to really think about the fact that, you know, we are an event in celebration of the built environment. Um, just a quick run through the aims and objectives of the festival just to get you thinking about um, how you might want to frame your event. So we're really looking to increase the number of Glaswegians who are engaged in celebrating um, the built environment. Um, we want to increase the profile of the city um, and this might be advertising it to other regions of Scotland um, and we're also thinking about um, 
our international audience. Now, the international audience um, really is an area of um, development that we haven't had the resources to look into um, the way that I would like. Um, but we do know that that, in, that in international audience is very interested. Um, and we know that because during the digital festival and in 2021, and even last year, we had that digital program and we had people tuning in from uh, from South, uh, South, from New Zealand um, and from Australia, um, coming into these lectures and getting up at all times in the morning so that they could attend them. So we know that these people are really, really interested in, and one way of cultivating that international audience is through the development of these digital resources, which I've mentioned already. Um, and again, just um, activities which uh, provide educational opportunities. Okay, um, just to run through some of the participant responsibilities, um, we do ask you to stick to deadlines that will be set. Um, and this is just to allow us to plan the festival as best we can. Um, we are very excited that we're going to have a new marketing person on board to support um, GBBT uh, very soon. Um, and so this marketing person, you know, uh, will be working alongside me and will be reaching out to you and wanting to find out the things that you want to promote about your event. And so the sooner we get that information, the, the sooner we can start to build that marketing plan. So it is important that you try to stick to deadlines as best you can. Um, delivering your events is detailed in your application and communicating any changes. It's just really important that what we say on the website is, is what you do so that when visitors show up, um, they are getting, you know, what was advertised. And, and of course, if things do change and things will change, things always change um, uh, with the development of, of, of some events um, at the last minute, you know, maybe someone's not able to, to run a tour um, or, you know, maybe the building has to close for, for, for some reason. Um, these are all things that we've faced in the past and, and that those things, you know, we expect them and it's all fine. But it's just important that we have that information so that we can get that to, to any visitors. Um, reporting accurate visitor numbers. This is just about evaluation. Um, we all know that, uh, you know, the economic climate uh, is causing certain funding cuts and being able to justify our funding is, is more important than ever. Um, so we really do ask you to fill in the survey at the end of the event and be encouraging visitors to be filling in our survey. Um, and to, part of that is also reporting accurate visitor numbers. We will be offering volunteers. Um, I, I'm also excited to share with you that we're going to have a new volunteer coordinator this year. Um, and so that volunteer coordinator will be able to work with you uh, to figure out you know, what volunteers should be doing um, and how they should how best to support your events. Um, and these volunteers will, will be able to assist in gathering uh, visitor evaluation surveys. Um, so we'll talk more about that as, as kind of weeks and months go on as well. Um, and yeah, just being aware of uh, the resources that are available to you, uh, such as risk assessments. And um, on the right hand side of the screen here, you can see a picture of the event organizers handbook, and that can be downloaded from the festival website uh, via the participate page. And again, and also on the participant dashboard. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the theme for the event now. I'm very interested to see what you think about it and whether you've had any ideas, but uh, we made a little film. I'm very grateful to the poet Liz Lockhead, who donated uh, a line from her poem, A Nonsense Rhyme for Molly, um, so that we could incorporate it into the film. Uh, so we're going to play you that just now.
Touch. Taste. Look. Smell. Tree. Fish. Bird. Bell. So do as the poet says and listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. And listen. So the theme is the sensory city and we are inviting you to tell the story of Glasgow through the senses. Um, as always, the theme is it's just a, a curatorial tool. Um, it's not something that you have to comply with at all. Some people have been running, you know, walks uh, for very successfully for several years, um, which are always booked out. So we're really not asking you to adapt. Um, don't, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Um, but for those of you perhaps with buildings who have been in the program for, for quite a long time, it can be a useful to, to think about a different way to tell uh, the story of your building. Um, so, you know, we might, you might be thinking about uh, like football songs, um, if, if it was a uh, uh, like one, one of the stadiums that was going to going to participate in the event uh, or the football chance, the sounds of, of that space, or maybe you want to um, remember old weaving songs of, of uh, industrial Dalmarnock. Um, we can, or maybe you want to do a talk about the, the River Clyde and the sound of the river uh, being a constant through the ages. Um, or you want to talk about the smells of the city. I think someone from the Clydeside Distillery is here today. So, you know, you want to be talking about all the smells that are involved in, in that process and um, uh, all, the, all the tastes with many historic cafes and bars in the city. And we've had some very successful uh, food tours in the past. So we'd really love to hear from anyone that would like to explore uh, that aspect of the city as well. Um, I'm now very pleased to introduce Judith. Um, so Judith, you just want to unmute yourself. Hello. Hi. Okay. Um, thank you, Stephen. Um, as I say, uh, yeah, I'm Judith from Carbon Consultancy. Uh, we are working with the festival and then by extension with you um, to tackle the carbon emissions created by the festival and sort of do our bit to address the climate emergency. So, um, you know, I think we've all heard of sort of climate change and we're aware of the issue, but it's both a sort of global and a local issue. So, you know, we hear stories of um, increased temperatures, flooding, things like that globally, but um, it's also worth pointing out that Glasgow um, is predicted to also, you know, be at risk to things like infrastructure, transport, um, crops and the ecosystems that we have. Um, because of climate change. So in 2019, um, Glasgow City Council declared an, a climate and ecological emergency. So I think as event organisers and sort of participants, there's an obvious benefit to events like these, um, sort of thinking back to those festival aims, um, especially when they sort of open people's eyes to preserving parts of the community and working to sort of sustain and like save what we have. Um, so there's an enormous benefit, but um, every event creates carbon emissions and sort of they all contribute to climate change in some way. And the festival, unfortunately, is no exception. Um, so we need to find that sort of balance between um, doing what we need to do to um, run the festival, but also um, not impacting future generations, which is really what sustainability is all about, is finding that balance between future generations and what our needs are now. Um, so we are going to be finding out where the festival creates the most carbon emissions and then making long term changes um, with the guys at the festival, which will have the biggest impact possible. So we can only really achieve that through your help. You're obviously an enormous part of this festival. Um, the participants sort of creating the festival content and all the festival goers as well and um, make up the biggest impact on the footprint. So you can have the choices around like where you go, what you do, and also how you travel. Um, and we want to find out how you're planning to run your events, but also we want to sort of be able to arm you with like practical changes you can make and um, to improve your carbon footprint and then make those tangible changes. So that's that kind of knock on effect. So 
Um, that is what we are going to be doing. And I'm just going to go into, um, great, that's fine. Um, how is it all going to sort of work? So there's sort of two parts to this. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is that measurement, that piece about what is the carbon footprint. Um, so we really need to come up with a number. We need to measure this. Um, so this year we're going to be asking questions and um, collecting some data and creating a picture of the carbon footprint. Um, so when you create a submission, you'll probably notice you're going to be asked some questions about you know be weird and wonderful questions you might not know the answer to about like how are you powering and heating the buildings and things like materials and waste um but these questions help us gather that data which we could then use to calculate the footprint um the second part to that is reducing the footprint so one, once we know where the carbon comes from um we can address it so we're looking to improve year on year and if we can pinpoint where we can make the biggest improvements we can sort of start from that point um, it's worth noting as well, though, that we aren't waiting for next year to start making improvements. Um, so we've sort of added some suggestions to the questions to give you a bit of a, like inspiration about some ideas um, and what you could potentially bring to your event. Um, so these are suggestions which we think would have the biggest impact, but it might be that you know your event quite well and you can kind of pinpoint another part of it and you go, hang on, that might actually save us a lot of carbon. So really, you know, get um, it's just for inspiration. Anything that you're kind of doing um, it would be great to know about. So um, these are the kind of sustainability stories, I guess, and these these kind of um, ways that we're finding we can enrich things for our sustainability action. So not just um, reducing carbon, but also um, telling that story about how we're preserving and sort of sustaining um, the environment. So that is the sort of bigger sustainability story. Um, Stephen, do you want to just pop into that? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, so just running through what I was saying about the tips and these kind of ideas that we've got, um, I'm just going to run through three now, which are quite sort of high level and you might go, yeah, 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 I've thought of that. But other people might go, hang on, I haven't thought of that. So um, these are a few areas which we think should be focused on to try and lower the footprint. Um, there's more details about this in the submission, de um, the submission form, but um, this is just a few pointers here. So the first is probably encouraging things like walking, cycling, and using trains and buses. Um, this is all sort of well and good, but I think a lot of people, particularly if they don't know Glasgow as well, they might go, I don't have a clue where I'm going. So you could encourage this by sort of linking to maybe like a local journey planner and um, suggesting like appropriate bus routes, enjoyable walking routes from sort of the main hubs, like the main stations. Um, there's also things like suggesting safe cycle routes and where to park your bike. That's a really, really important one. If people are cycling there, I think that's the first thing they'd want to know is where to park the bike. Um, and also walking routes, you could present and um, perhaps sort of prioritise having an enjoyable walk and maybe going past some other features of the festival um, rather than sort of getting there quickly. So just making that sort of public transport or active travel as enjoyable as possible and um, as stress-free as possible. Um, the next one is probably that do more with less peace. So an example of this is um, going digital. Um, and, you know, we've mentioned, Stephen mentioned this earlier in the presentation, but um, where you can go digital is actually where you're going to probably find a lot of savings. So just creating the printed materials um, almost always has a bigger carbon footprint than you think. And that's even sort of recycled and recyclable materials. Um, and then using an electronic device to encourage you maybe people to use their phones or things on screens um, for things like maybe a map or another document that is always going to save you carbon compared to printing. Um, if you want to give something physical, um, it's good to think about the life cycle. So that's why I've got a picture of a chicken if that <laughs> I haven't come to that yet. But um, if you think about the life cycle of the item before you buy it, you can start to think about how you can reduce the impact at the creation stage, um, how long it's going to be used for, and how will it be disposed of. So if you're just, you know, providing something which will just be used for the day, then it might go in the bin. It might be better to think, how can I make this a more memorable item that is used long term and is maybe kept as a souvenir? Um, so, yeah, just thinking about the life of that product once it's left the room, how's that going to work? Um, and finally, the powering and heating of the space. I think this is going to be a big one for a lot of people. Um, if the building's sort of not um, used day to day and it doesn't have, um, you know, its, its own sort of energy supply, things like that, um, you might need to bring in 
your own heating or lighting potentially. Um, and I think with a lot of things to do with saving energy and saving carbon, it's also going to save money. So really thinking about what you would do to save money and save energy, that's also probably going to help your carbon footprint. Um, so thinking about your use of space, if you're just using a small area within a sort of larger space, um, then trying to get a heater, for instance, like an infrared heater, which actually heats objects rather than the air. So if you've got a large space to fill, if you're just pumping out loads of hot air, but you're only using a tiny little piece of it, um, it's going to use a lot more energy. So trying to think about how you're heating the space um, to just use what you need. Um, it's any sort of any heat as you do bring, just try and use like the lowest wattage possible. Um, really just depends on your space and what's available, but um, either using the, the heating that's already there and the lighting that's already there. But if you are bringing anything, just keep the wattage as low as possible. That's probably the main the main piece. So those are just some of the ideas. Um, and I suppose, Stephen, if you if I throw it over to any questions anyone has. Yeah, yeah, please do. If anyone, we will have um, a time for questions relating to the festival generally at the end. But if anyone wants to ask anything specific uh, to the climate emergency, please do um, either write in the chat or just unmute yourself and you can ask a question just now. Okay. okay, well, um, if anyone does have any questions about that, they can, they can pass and we can. Oh, wait, okay. Hi, I... Irene. Hi. Um, Hi. It's a kind of general question, but I'll link it into your section. Um, so the dates for Glasgow this year is the 16th to the, what is the actual dates of the festival for Glasgow? I was looking through it. It's the um, 11th to the 17th. 11th to the 17th, okay. And also, um, oh, a lot of the focus is on buildings now. Previous, so I'm representing Greyfriars Biophilic Community Garden, um, and I would hope that we would um, certainly be able to meet the theme. Um, and we're on the site of the former pump house, which is a bit of lost heritage to Glasgow, which we want to begin to focus on. Um, and uh, and I'm thinking about the bit that particularly applies is about the do more with less and about reducing printed materials and things like that. I just wonder if you could say a wee bit more about that, um, Judith. Um, yeah, do you mean in terms of like the impacts of printed materials? Or... Well, I think I think it's more about, um, you know, we're, like previously in uh, another Doors Open, we did a, a garden quiz with children and we had printed out, you know, quiz forms for them. Yeah. And I just think that's more my what my world is more user friendly than any kind of digital you know though a lot of the kids might have digital yeah. apps. I suppose it's about that balance between using the technology we have but at the same time um you know the printed world can still have a value in terms of engagement absolutely yeah and I mean if you've got lots of people coming through and you want to try and maybe do something a bit more tactile because I know obviously screens can be a bit fiddly sometimes as well you could just do the old-fashioned trick of laminating things and using whiteboards and um re kind of reusing those pieces rather than like printing lots and lots of versions you could have sort of laminated piece of paper people can write it on with whiteboard pens um yeah just reusing as much as possible really um in that kind of environment and then I guess if you could use any screens I suppose you can't really use any screens outdoors, it would be quite tricky, but um, any sort of boards you can bring out that show the information that you can just reuse session after session, I think that's probably the way forward, really. Thanks. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Judith? Okay, well, um, as I said, if any questions do come up, um, I can take note of them and, do, and I can pass them to Judith or I can do my best to answer them. But uh, thank you very much, Judith, for being with right. us this morning. Um, I'm now just going to move on to this year's event and just run through um, the, the format for the festival. So we're sticking pretty much with the format from last year. Um, Monday to Sunday, we're going to have in-person events um, at the Festival Hub. Um, and 
yeah, you'll have your events at the Festival Hub, and you'll have digital events, and you'll have digital resources. And then the Friday to Sunday is our kind of our uh, open or in-person program. And um, so you've got the buildings, the trails, and the events, and, and any events that will happen at the Festival Hub as well. Um, the only real difference to last year is that um, uh, we only had digital events Monday to Friday last year, but we are encouraging anyone who would like to run a digital event at the weekend, a Zoom session um, or a workshop on Zoom or, or um, something like that, um, please do submit that um, for Saturdays and Sundays as well, if that suits you better. Um, we will not be producing a printed brochure again this year. Um, and this is, you know, for the reasons that Judith has just been explaining, um, it, it just doesn't really make sense. We probably will distribute a flyer which people can use for more marketing. Um, and we will be in touch with you later on in the year um, about disseminating those resources to you. Um, so getting your submission to us, it's, we're using the festival website. Again, um, which we are continuing to develop, as I mentioned earlier on, we're hoping that bookings will actually go through the website um, this year. Um, so we're still working on that. But at the moment, we, what you do is go to the participate page on the website. If you have your login from last year, um, just use that and you will be able to just amend the submission that you made last year. You don't have to make a new submission, which is one of the benefits of, of using it through, through the website rather than the Google Forms that we used to use. Um, so hopefully you can just go there and there and make any amendments and it should be a very quick um, application for you. Uh, there are the eight different forms to choose from. So I've spoken about these different categories already. The no booking necessary, booking essential and booking optional for buildings. For digital listings, we've got digital events and digital trails and also digital resources. So digital resources are things like films. Um, and then we've got the in-person categories, uh, the in-person trails and the in-person events. Um, and the events are, are, are obviously the buildings are also events, but we separate. Uh, if your event is not attached to a building, then we ask you to submit in the events category. Um, when you signed up for the session, there was an option to uh, ask questions and someone someone um, had asked a question and they were, weren't sure about where they should be submitting because it was going to be two events within the same building. So what I would suggest in, in that scenario is that you would submit, make a submission for the building itself if you're going to be doing visits to the building. And then if there are also special events, maybe are separately ticketed, you would um, make a separate submission for that event um, because that just means that each different aspect of what you're doing is going to have its own listing within the website um, and you'll be able to keep the ticketing separate for each of those events. So yeah, if you are running different events which have different tickets, um, then you will want to make a different submission for each of those. Um, the last thing I really wanted to mention was that in November, we hold a civic reception at the city chambers. Um, and this is a really, this is an opportunity for us to thank you all um, for being part of the festival. Um, and we will be running some awards. Um, here you can see a photograph of uh, the ceremony last year. Um, and the Tenementals, this is an example, Tenementals um, with Trades House, uh, one outstanding event. They had a concert at Trades House, uh, which or Trades Hall, uh, which is a really fantastic event from last year. Um, so the categories that we're looking at this year is Above and Beyond Participant, Above and Beyond Volunteer, Outstanding Event and Talk, um, and a new one for this year will be outstanding effort to reduce the carbon footprint of your event um, and in an effort to encourage people to be running activities for children and young people. We're also looking at an award for the outstanding event for children and young people. Um, so the call for submissions closes on the 19th of May. Um, so I do encourage you if you've got any questions, um, 
please do get in touch with me as soon as possible um, and I'll make myself available to chat through your event and, and help you make the submission the way that you want it to be. Um, that's not to say that if you submit something now, that's exactly what you have to deliver. Like I said earlier on, we do recognise that there's you know, a few months between now and the festival and your plans might develop. So if you're not sure exactly what you want to do, make your submission now, um, but you can note in it that there's more details to follow and there will be an opportunity to log into the website after you've uh, made your submission and up, make any updates, um, probably up until um, the month before the event. So yeah, even if you're not sure, please still do get your submission in as soon as possible so that we can get a, an idea, a picture of, of what the event's gonna look like this year. Um, just as a last reminder, um, what we're we looking for, events relating to the Doors Open Day's mission and aims, which we talked about earlier on, um, events relating to the theme, perhaps. Most important that the events have to be free to attend. And if you're opening a building which is usually open to the public, we do ask you to be um, offering something extra. Um, and last to say is thank you. Thank you for being here today. Um, thank you for uh, making the festival what it is. Doors Open Days is in its 35th year. Um, and that is all down to the dedication of you, the participants. Um, so we are really grateful to the organisations and individuals that give up their time um, and their energy to be part of the festival. Um, and yeah, with that, um, I will open it to any questions? Um, could could I ask? Yeah, hi Mary, how you doing? Fine, how are you, Stephen? Yeah, very well, thank you. Um, I was thinking, um, probably this year I would just, um, more or less do the same as I did last year, if that's all right. That would be the 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 we radical Wars, wars talk I, I do. Um, up at the um, Sight Hill Cemetery, and then um, later on, the one, the bigger one I, I did in the hub, um, like, just like last year. Although I thought just because of the themes of sound and all that, the the, the talk in the hub, which is based on a kind of PowerPoint thing as a, as a talk, um, I might bring in a, a song um, re relevant to the Radical Wars, which I've got on my on my previous digital one that I, I did during the pandemic. So would that be all right? I wouldn't be changing it anything really apart from inserting that song. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, there's several events in the programme that have um, been solid, um, yeah. you know, staples of the programme for uh -huh. a long time, and we don't want you to be changing anything yeah, uh, okay, if it's not necessary. Fine. But um, it just means that we can, um, you know, through perhaps the education department or through our, our marketing and our comms, we can be trying to encourage different audiences to come yeah. along to oh, the talk. So, yeah, yeah. Um, you didn't you didn't win best talk for nothing. We're, we're keen to see it again. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to mention that. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Does anyone else have any questions? Um, I have a question yeah. just just around. So I'm from Glasgow Food Policy Partnership and we'd really like to run a tour of different kind of community food spaces. I think that would align really well with the theme. Um, but I was just wondering for those that have run walking tours before, how long you think is a good amount of time to have people kind of walking around before they're going to get a bit fatigued? Uh, we have several seasoned uh, walk leaders with us in the space. I don't know, Charlie or, or Mary, if, you, if you'd like to, to speak on that. I have my own views on it, but it'd be good probably, Charlie, if you want to. Yeah, I mean, I, I do a Broomhill Heritage Trail, which uh, depends upon the number of questions that people ask. I mean, it, it probably it's advertised for two and a half hours. But there's plenty of places that people can lean against walls and uh, things like that, not and not necessarily sit down. Uh, I, you don't want to really make it more than uh, two and a half hours. I mean, given the Glasgow weather, I mean, sometimes half an hour is probably yeah, too long. But uh, I mean, it, it depends on the people. I mean, if, if they're sort of young and healthy, then uh, you, you sort of speed along. But you know, a couple, a couple of hours is... Is, is the sort of tolerance for most people, I would say. 
Yeah, I think that, you know, you have to obviously then take into account toilet stops and, and um, you know, if people want to get refreshments. Um, one thing that is, is important, and I'm glad you asked a question for this reason, is that sometimes people, um, they get frustrated when things run on much longer than they're advertised to because they've booked in lots of different events on the one day and they don't want to cut their tour short. They want to hear everything you've got to say, but they also don't want to miss out. So it is important to try and stick to um, the times. And that goes with whether you're delivering a talk, a building tour or a trail out and about as well. Okay, hey, great, thanks. That's really helpful. No worries. Does anyone else have a question? Oh, there's Catherine. Oh, no, she's not a question. <laughs> um, there were actually some questions also from that spreadsheet. Let me see. Uh, someone had asked how the success of an event can be evaluated. Um, so we have our own uh, survey that we disseminate through the website. And as I mentioned, we'll be encouraging volunteers to be asking people to do that. And we'll also be asking, there's a, there's a survey for visitors and a survey for participants. Um, so we're asking people, you know, like visitor numbers, that's one way of recording a successful event, uh, speaking to people, just doing little interviews on the spot, finding out what people thought about it, finding out if people felt like they learned something. Um, and yeah, just gathering as much information as, as possible. Um, and if it's helpful to people, I'm happy to share our survey um, in advance. So you can be thinking about the kinds of questions to be asking people. I would encourage you just to use our survey rather than creating your own so that we can keep all of that um, information together. Um, yeah, that's one way of, or that's how you know we evaluate the success of the event. Um, and someone, someone else was asking about how they can make the most of their event. Um, I think, you know, you could think about having a creative response to, to the heritage, um, perhaps working with artists, um, or maybe you want to work with community groups and, and be encouraging them to have some sort of response, and maybe putting on an exhibition, you know, as we talked about earlier, putting on something extra. Um, that's not usually in the space if it is indeed a building that you're opening. Um, you could also considering applying for funding. Um, I do appreciate that, you know, certainly for, for time resource, it's, it's, it's a big ask to be putting on these events. So if you do want to put in a funding application, um, we'll be happy to talk about that with you. And we might be able to, um, to uh, support that funding application. Charlie, you're asking for details on Guidego. So Guidego is um, a website, uh, basically uh, we have a login for it and we share that login um, with participants and you essentially go in there and ask you lots of different questions about your trail. So you'll be asked to submit the photography for your trail. You'll ask if we submit um, you know, the, the name of your trail, the name of each stop, um, the coordinates for each stop, you plot those on a map. And you write a little bit about um, you know, what you would say at, at each stop. And then you can also upload sound files. Um, and then once all that information is in the website, it automatically creates a digital trail for you. Um, and this can be accessed either by downloading the guide go app or it can be accessed on the guide go website. Um, and so it's a really great tool because it means that people can go out about and enjoy walking the route themselves or if they're not able to, or if they prefer not to um, go out and about, they can actually walk the route digitally um, from the comfort of their own homes. Um, and the, you know, the great thing about these is now we have this incredible bank of them. And as I said earlier on, they are being disseminated to uh, the education department and through our website. Um, so if you've not had a look at it already, I would encourage you to jump on to the resource portal that's, that's on our website. And you can have a look at the kind of the other trails that people have created. Um, it's a lot of work to bring these trails together, but um, you know they do have you do get good mileage out of them. So if something that you want to chat about, then please do get in touch with me, um, and I'll be happy to do that. No worries, Charlie. Um, are there any other questions? No. Okay. Well, um, again, thank.